Kyrgyz government wants Malaysia to appoint advisor to the Republic. Slovak Prime Minister fights for life after assassination attempt. Good afternoon and salam Malaysia Madani. This is World Today and I am Sahi Samshidin. The Kyrgyz Republic has expressed its desire for Malaysia to appoint an advisor to the country. Prime Minister Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim said the request was made by his Kyrgyz counterpart, Chairman of the Cabinet of Minister Akhlebek Zaparov at a meeting at the Ala Arka State Residence. Malah-malah dia minta kalau boleh, kita lantik seorang yang boleh jadi penasihat kepada kerajaan dia. Itu tahap penghormatan dia dan pengiktirafan dia kepada kerajaan Malaysia. Maksudnya bila nak nak gunding soal persuastaan ataupun uh, nak mengena, uh, ada projek-projek hidro umpamanya, ataupun um, highway. Highway. highway dan juga highway. penggalian emas. Semua dia minta kalau boleh kita menafakkan pengalaman kita bagi nasihat untuk bantu. Dato' Sri Anwar said this at a press conference in conjunction with his two-day official visit to Kyrgyz Republic. He also said that the request of the Kyrgyz Republic would be discussed at the next cabinet meeting. The Prime Minister views the potential appointment of the advisor as not only part of the conduct of bilateral relations but also providing opportunities for investors from Malaysia as there are numerous areas of cooperation for the two countries to explore. Touching on tourism, the Premier said this sector has great potential to be strengthened between Malaysia and the Kyrgyz Republic as both countries have unique attractions of their own. Keindahan negeri ini dan kawasan pergunungannya itu satu tarikan yang tersendiri dan mereka pula sangat berminat kawasan hutan kita dan juga keindahan kota-kota di Malaysia dan pantai. Apart from this, Dr. Sri Anwar said the Kyrgyz Republic has also asked for more opportunities for its students to study in Malaysia. Commenting further on cooperation with the Kyrgyz Republic, which began in 1992, he said it is time for this cooperation to be strengthened as it benefits the country. Asked about his official visit to Central Asian countries, including Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, the Prime Minister said the Central Asian region has great potential for cooperation to be explored. Newly minted Singapore Prime Minister Lawrence Wong said his government will strengthen partnerships near and far while advancing the nation's interests in the backdrop of rising rivalry and tension in an international sphere. Wong, in his maiden speech after being sworn in as the country's head of government at the Istana, said Singapore will also continue engaging with both the US and China, even as issues inevitably arise between them. He noted that Singapore seeks to be friends with all while upholding its rights and interests. As a small country, we cannot escape these powerful cross-currents. As an open economy, our livelihoods will be hit when multilateralism fractures. As a diverse society, we will be vulnerable to external influences that tuck us in different directions. We must brace ourselves to these new realities and adapt to a messier, riskier and more violent world. Wong said Singapore is no stranger to tough external circumstances and has successfully weathered the storm and even emerged stronger due to the people's high level of trust and the ability to work well together. He also pledged to serve the people of Singapore and to seek their support and trust as he and his team embark on a new journey to bring Singapore forward. Signing. Thailand may have to consider relocating its capital Bangkok because of rising sea levels. Projections consistently show that low-lying Bangkok risks being inundated by the ocean before the end of the century. Much of the bustling capital already battles flooding during the rainy season. Deputy Director General of the Government's Department of Climate Change and Environment, Pavich Kasavong, warned that the city might not be able to adapt with the world on its current warming pathway. Referring to the increase in global temperatures from pre-industrial levels, he believes that the data recorded in Bangkok is already beyond the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit. 
Bangkok city government is exploring measures that include building dikes along the lines of those used in the Netherlands. However, Pavic said the government has been thinking about moving, noting that the discussions are still hypothetical and the issue is very complex. While the move is still a long way from being adopted as policy, it would not be unprecedented in the region. Indonesia will inaugurate this year its new capital, Nusantara, which will replace sinking and polluted Jakarta as the country's political center. The federal government of Brazil has guaranteed an aid worth $233 million to its flood victims. Its president, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, made this commitment during a visit to a rain heat area where he announced a set of recovery measures. We approved a month ago the maior programa de crédito da história deste país vai ter crédito para catador de material reciclável vai ter crédito para empregada doméstica vai ter crédito para o micro pequeno empreendedor vai ter crédito para todo mundo para o grande e para o pequeno e vai ter um crédito especial sabe para financiar habitação para o setor de classe média vamos tentar uniformizar esse país. Lula said the federal government would distribute $992 to 240,000 families that have lost homes or property. At Saulo Leopoldo, one of the cities affected by the floods, Lula also mentioned his administration will bring forward the payment of some social benefits for the state's citizens while planning to buy homes from the private sector to give to displaced people. Experts warn Brazil's southernmost state capital may suffer severe flooding for weeks to come. The floods have devastated dozens of towns in and from Porto Alegre, where the downtown area remains underwater. In the whole state, the death toll was at 149, while 108 were still missing. Some 250,000 dresses are still without power and more than 136,000 people have lost access to water. A wildfire in Canada's major oil-producing region doubled in size as it drew closer to the city of Fort McMurray, but officials were hopeful shifting winds and cooler temperatures could weaken and push it away. The blaze scorched almost 21,000 hectares of forest overnight as it came within 4.5 kilometres of the city that was partly evacuated the day before. However, the local authority urged residents to remain vigilant, noting that wildfire conditions can change and deteriorate rapidly. After being pulled from the front lines the day before, firefighters were back along with water bombers, dropping retardant, while heavy equipment operators built fire guards southwest of Fort McMurray. Canadian authorities have been bracing for another possibly devastating wildfire season after the country's worst ever last year saw flames burning from coast to coast and carrying more than 15 million hectares of land. Canada is the world's fourth largest producer and a leading exporter of crude to the United States. Slovak Prime Minister Robert Fico is no longer in a life-threatening condition after he was shot in an assassination attempt when leaving a government meeting. The government shot for Fico five times, initially leaving the Prime Minister in critical condition and undergoing surgery hours later. Slovak Deputy Prime Minister and Environment Minister Tomas Taraba said the operation went well and he believes that Fico will survive. Taraba said one bullet went through Fico's stomach and a second hit a joint. Interior Minister Matus Sutaj Astok had said earlier that Fico was in life-threatening condition while he remained in the operating room. He said the assassination attempt was politically motivated and the perpetrator's decision was born closely after the presidential election in April won by a FICO ally, Peter Pellegrini. The shooting in the central Slovak town of Hanlova, where Slovak media said was carried out by a 71-year-old man, stunned the small central European nation and drew international condemnation. Russian President Vladimir Putin and US President Joe Biden joined Slovakia's EU partners in expressing shock and condemnation of the shooting. The country of 5.4 million has seen polarized political debate in recent years, including the hard-fought presidential election last month that helped tighten FICO's grip on power. Still ahead, EU urges Israel to end Rafah operation immediately. The European Union has urged Israel to end its operation in Rafah immediately. 
According to the EU, the operation disrupt the distribution of humanitarian aid in Gaza, leading to more internal displacement, famine and suffering. EU Chief Diplomat Joseph Borrell said the EU is calling on Israel to refrain from further exacerbating the already dire humanitarian situation in Gaza and reopen the crossing point of Rafah. Should Israel continue its military operation in Rafah, he said it would inevitably put a heavy strain on the EU's relationship with Israel. Borrell also said that under international humanitarian law, Israel must allow and facilitate unimpeded passage of humanitarian relief for civilians citing International Court of Justice orders. The bloc, the main aid donor for the Palestinian territories and Israel's biggest trading partner, said more than a million people in and around Rafah had been ordered by Israel to flee the area to other zones the United Nations says cannot be considered safe. Israel's main allies, the United States and the EU, as well as the United Nations, have all warned Israel against a major operation in Rafah, given that it would add to the civilian toll. Israel's military has conducted a relentless bombardment from the air and a ground offensive inside Gaza that has killed more than 35,000, mostly civilians. Meanwhile, Hamas chief Ismail Haniyeh said the group will be involved in deciding post-war rule in Gaza along with other Palestinian factions. Ismail Haniyeh said the Hamas group will stay in Palestine and will be Hamas and all national Palestinian factions who will decide the post-war rule in Gaza. He also said the fate of truce talks was uncertain because of Israel's insistence on occupying the Rafah crossing and on its expansion of the aggressions in the Palestinian territory since 7 October. Ismail Haniyeh reiterated the group's position concerning truce talks that have again hit and in pace. He said any agreement must ensure a permanent ceasefire, comprehensive withdrawal of Israeli forces from all sectors of the Gaza Strip, a real deal for exchange of prisoners, the return of displaced persons, reconstruction and lifting the siege of Gaza. His commands came after Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said any discussions on who rules Gaza after the war was just empty talks as long as Hamas remains in the territory. However, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant appeared to challenge Netanyahu, saying it had to be Palestinian entities ruling the Gaza after the war. He said Netanyahu should make a decision and declare that Israel will not establish civilian control over the Gaza Strip. Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in China today for a two-day state visit during which he will meet President Xi Jinping. Putin was welcomed by Chinese officials and an honor guard as he got off his plane. The Russian president expected to meet with counterpart Xi Jinping as he seeks greater support from Beijing for his war effort in Ukraine and discuss their comprehensive partnership and strategic cooperation. Both leaders are also expected to define key areas of development of Russian-Chinese cooperation and exchange views on international and regional issues. This is Putin's first trip aboard since his March re-election as president and the second in just over six months to China. Xi, who returned last week from a three-nation tour of Europe, has rebuffed Western criticism of his country's ties with Moscow. Finland plans to change its conscription rules to allow thousands of reservists to help patrol its border with Russia should there be a sudden wave of migrants. Finns who have completed military service in the border forces could be called up to patrol the Nordic country's border with Russia in exceptional circumstances. Finland, which joined the NATO military alliance in April last year, has accused Moscow of weaponizing migration against the Nordic nation, an assertion the Kremlin denies. Finland shut its 1,340-kilometer-long border with Russia late last year, amid a growing number of arrivals from countries such as Syria and Somalia via Russia. Border guard data showed that some 1,300 asylum seekers crossed the border from Russia to Finland last year, compared with less than 40 this year after the passenger crossings were shut. But the Finnish government fears the phenomenon it calls a hybrid attack by Russia could restart at any moment and is preparing legislation to deal with the threat. Finland has a conscription army, meaning military service is compulsory for men. The government said more than 10,000 conscripts have been trained by the border guard, while a fourth of them are staff border guards. France ordered troops to guard ports and the international airports in its Pacific territory of New Caledonia as a state of emergency started today after two nights of riots left at least four dead and hundreds wounded. 
turmoil erupted after France's National Assembly backed disputed changes to voting rules that indigenous Kanak leaders said will dilute their vote. Presidential Emmanuel Macron offered to hold talks with new Caledonian lawmakers while also approving the use of security forces and a nighttime curfew to halt the worst violence scene in four decades. Shops have been looted and public buildings torched during nighttime violence. Government spokeswoman Priska Tavnot said under the state of emergency, authorities will be able to enforce travel bans, house arrests and searches. According to the authorities, five radical independence activists accused of organising violence were immediately put under house arrest. Along with a night curfew, there are bans on gatherings, the carrying of weapons and the sale of alcohol. Extra troops and security forces would also be flown to New Caledonia. Nearly 1,800 law enforcement officers have been mobilised and a further 500 will reinforce them. Peruvian President Dina Bolarate was questioned by prosecutors investigating what has become to be known as a Rolex gate, a corruption scandal shaking her already unpopular government. This is the second time Bolarate has been summoned to testify since the scandal erupted in March over the discovery of a trove of undeclared luxury Rolex watches and jewellery. After an hour, she left the prosecutor's office in downtown Lima without making a statement. Outside the building, guarded by police, a dozen demonstrators called for her resignation. Borate told prosecutors last month the Rolex watches had been loaned by her friend, the regional governor of Ayacuco, Wilfredo Oscorima. She is also being investigated for passive corruption for receiving improper benefits from public officials. If the prosecution indicts her, Bolarate can only be tried at the end of her mandate in July 2026 under the Constitution. The president, who has an approval rating of 12% according to an Ipsos poll, does not have or lead a party in Congress, requiring her to secure backing from conservatives. Dina Bolarate took office in December 2022, replacing left-wing president Pedro Castillo, who was impeached and imprisoned for unsuccessfully trying to dissolve Congress. Former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan was granted bail in Islamabad on land corruption charges but will have to stay in jail to serve time in two other cases. The former cricket superstar was indicted last week on charges that he and his wife were gifted land by a real estate developer when Khan was Prime Minister from 2018 to 2022 in exchange for illegal favours. Khan, who denies wrongdoing, had filed a bail application before Islamabad High Court. His party lawyer, Naim Haider Panjuta, confirmed the granting of bail but said Khan remained in custody after two convictions, one involving the leaking of state secrets and the other his marriage violating Islamic law. Khan has been in jail since August last year. In total, he has been convicted in four cases, but sentences in two cases have been suspended. Khan is named in dozens of cases, including charges of inciting violence against the state in the aftermath of his removal from office in 2002 in a parliamentary vote of no confidence. His wife, Bushra Bibi, is also in jail serving time in a case related to unlawfully marrying Khan in 2018. Next up in sports, Manchester United beat Newcastle to keep European hopes alive. National women's hockey team failed to qualify for the 2024 Asia Cup Women's Indoor Hockey Final after a 2-1 loss to host and defending champions Thailand. In a match at the Thailand National Sports University, Malaysia conceded as early as the seventh minute through penalty corner goal by Tokadev Jira Chaya. The host carried on the momentum and scored another one through Sakul Petak Tikampon. Unwilling to go down without putting a fight, the national squad raised up their tempo. Nur Atira Mohamed Ismail managed to score the only goal in the semi final for Malaysia. The scoreline remains until the final whistle, and Thailand are set to face off Kazakhstan, who beat Indonesia in a penalty shootout following a tie. Malaysia will square off against Indonesia for the third and fourth place. In the English Premier League, Manchester United kept their hopes alive of salvaging a dismal season alive by qualifying for Europe as Ahmad Diallo's rocket inspired a 3-2 win against Newcastle. Eric Ten Hag's side are battling to secure a seventh place finish in the standing which could secure a place in next season's UEFA Conference League. 
United are still in the hunt for that place after beating Newcastle to move level on points with seven place Magpies. Goals from Kobe Mainu, Diallo and Rasmus Holin at Old Trafford gave United only their third win in nine league games. However, United's goal difference is vastly inferior to Newcastle's, meaning they must better the Magpies' result in the last game of the season. United will qualify for the Europa League if they win the FA Cup final against Manchester City on 25th May. But if City triumph at Wembley, then seven will be enough for a Conference League spot. United travel to Brighton on Sunday while Newcastle head to Brentford. Newcastle's defeat means fifth place Tottenham are guaranteed to be in the Europa League next season. Meanwhile, in another game, sixth place Chelsea won 2 1 at Brighton to move closer to European qualification after a turbulent campaign. Cole Palmer put Chelsea ahead with a 22nd league goal out of his superb season in the 34th minute. Christopher Nunku doubled Chelsea's advantage in the 64th minute with third league goal of an injury plagued first season with the club. Nunku finished off Malo's Gasto's cross to leave Brighton deflated. Chelsea defender Reece James was sent off in the 88th minute for kicking Jao Pedro after being knocked over at the Brighton striker. Danny Welbeck's close range finish in the 7th minute of stoppage time came too late to stop Chelsea, recording four successive league wins for the first time since October 2022. On another note, Premier League clubs will be given the chance to scrap video assistant referee from next season when they vote on the controversial review system at their annual general meeting next month. Wolf have submitted a resolution to abolish VAR to the Premier League, triggering a vote of the top flight's 20 teams on 6 June. The Molineux club said VAR is undermining the value of the Premier League brand after another season marred by a host of debatable decisions. In order for VAR to be axed by the Premier League, 14 of the 20 clubs will have to vote against it. The Wolves are expected to canvass other clubs in order to gain support before the meeting. VAR was introduced in the Premier League in 2019 with the aim of helping referees avoid clear and obvious errors that had marked matches in the past. But there have been numerous controversies surrounding the technology this season as Premier League managers and fans grow increasingly vocal in the their disdain for the system. In other news, Liverpool assistant manager Pep Linders is to become the new head coach at Australian club Red Bull Salzburg after his departure from Anfield at the end of the season. The Dutchman, who initially worked at Liverpool under Brendan Rodgers, will leave the Merseysiders along with current manager Jurgen Klopp come the conclusion of the Premier League campaign. He will begin his duty as head coach for the Australian club from the start of pre-season training in June. It is believed that Linders had signed a three-year contract with Salzburg. Salzburg sacked Gerhard Strober in April and appointed Ono Sinel as interim manager. Liverpool added that Victor Matos, who spent four and a half years as the club's elite development coach will also be joining Salzburg as assistance to Lingeris. In tennis, Alexander Zverev reached his 18th Masters semi-final in Rome after defeating Taylor Fritz 6-4, 6-3 to set up at last four duel with Alejandro Tabilo, the Chilean journeyman who had stunned Novak Djokovic earlier in the tournament. Zverev's moment of concern came in just the third game on centre court at the Foro Italico when he fell on the clay and landed on his front. The 2017 champion cut his left wrist and a finger in the tumble. Zverev suffered a serious ankle injury at the 2022 French Open after falling on the clay of Roland Garros during his semi-final against Rafael Nadal and missed the rest of the season. Today, however, he was able to dust himself down to defeat Fritz in 90 minutes, firing 20 winners with six aces and not facing a single break point. Meanwhile, Chile's Tabilo will play his first ever Masters 1000 semi final at the age of 26 after seeing off unseeded Zhang Zichen of China 6 3, 6 4 in 1 hour and 26 minutes. Tabilo, in fact, had far less trouble than he did in his battle with Karen Kachinov in the previous round, not facing a single break point on his way to the biggest match of his career at the last major tournament before the French Open. In the women's singles, second seed Ariana Savalenka needed just an hour and 13 minutes to see off Jelena Ostapenko 6-2, 6-4 on her way to the semis, improving her record against her Latvian opponent to three wins and no defeats. 
Sabalenka, who has won the most recent Australian Opens, was in a different class to Ostapenko, a former French Open winner who could do nothing in the face of some punishing hitting. Sabalenka will next take on Miami Open winner Daniela Collins, who eased past Victoria Azarenka 6-4, 6-3. The American fights six aces past Azarenka and converted five of 15 breakpoints opportunities. The 30-year-old Collins, ranked 15 in the world, announced in January that this would be her final season on the tour before retiring. She now has 19 wins in the last 20 matches, dating back to the start of Miami where she captured her first WTA 1000 title. The only loss since came against Sabalenka in three sets in the fourth round of the Madrid Open. Moving on to cycling, Jonathan Millen claimed his second win at this year's Giro d'Italia after taking the honours at Wednesday 11 stage in a messy punch sprint. Having already won stage four, Italian Millen piped a clutch of top sprinters to the line. After an easy day heading north along the Adriatic coast, all of the sprint and general classification contenders were involved in the long straight final sprint into a headwind. A nasty crash left several riders on the ground in the final kilometre, but in the sprint to the line, Lille track, rider Milan broke off Team Merlier's wheel, bursting through to notch his fifth win of the season. Milan's win was a reversal of the third stage when Saudal quick step, Belgian rider Merlier took the victory ahead of the current points jersey holder. The 23-year-old Milan leads Alpecin Australian rider Kagen Grove by 36 points. Slovenian Tadej Pogacar retains the leader's spin jersey with an unchanged lead of 2 minutes 40 seconds over Colombian Daniel Martinez, while Welshman Gorain Thomas is a further 16 seconds back in the third overall. And that wraps up a world today in our top story. Kyrgyz government wants Malaysia to appoint advisor to the republic. Tune in to Malaysia tonight coming up at 8:30 p.m. on TV One and Saluran Berita RTM. From the river to the sea, Paul Stein will be free. I'm Sahih Samsudin. Thank you for watching.